Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Shellen McCoy, and on behalf of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation, I'd like to say welcome uh, to today's webinar. And also have to say thank you to the Government of Canada for making this possible. Uh, for today's webinar, I'm very happy to, and pleased to be uh, introducing Jordan Corden. Uh, Jordan is the project coordinator for the Central Queens branch of the PI Wildlife Federation. He is currently in the final stages of finishing his master's degree in environmental sciences at the University of Prince Edward Island. His thesis titled, Factors that Affect Egg to Juvenile Survival in Atlantic Salmon on PI, investigated wild salmon reds on two PI streams, and in his thesis recorded the first data of a natural emergence timing from wild Atlantic salmon reds on PI. He has spent the last 11 years working on the West River in PI, helping rehabilitate watershed habitat. He has also assisted in updating the conservation strategy for Atlantic salmon on PI in 2018. When he's not working to help restore salmon habitat, you can find him angling for salmon. Today, he's going to be speaking on determination of factors affecting survival from egg to juvenile for Atlantic salmon in PI. After the presentation is over, we'll allow time for questions and answers, but I, I'll let you know when that time comes. But for right now, uh, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Jordan and for everybody to hear his presentation. Jordan. Perfect. Um, well, thank you for the introduction and thank you to the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation uh, for allowing me to uh, give this presentation on my master's project. So like Charlene mentioned, uh, my master's project focused on determining factors that affect egg to, egg to survival um, for juvenile salmon on PEI. So PEI is relatively a small province, um, but there's many streams and rivers. Um, so historically salmon are present on 70 of those rivers. Uh, they were reassessed in 2018 uh, during the renewal of the conservation strategy for PEI, and it was determined that they currently occupy 24 of those rivers. The reasons for population declines can be attributed to a long list of factors, but generally it, um, they can be related to poor land usage, climate change, and at sea mortality. Um, Atlantic salmon are indicators of a healthy aquatic environment where rivers that typically have more forested landscape uh, have healthier salmon populations. So many of you know, probably are familiar with this information, um, the salmon life cycle, but I'll go through it uh, just quickly. Um, and I guess it's important to note too that um, some of the specifics that I'm gonna talk about in their life history, um, they vary uh, throughout the salmon's range. So um, like Newfoundland or Quebec, um, might have slightly different variations of these life stages. Um, so what I'm talking about is more specific to PEI. So salmon are anadromous fish, meaning the adults leave the marine environment and enter the freshwater environment to spawn. The eggs incubate in the river from November to May, and the embryos hatch in May, where the alvin will remain in the gravel uh, for two to three weeks and then begin emerging as fry uh, late May, early June. The fry will reside in faster flowing sections of the river, such as runs and ripples. Um, after the first year of their life, they're called a par, and then the par can live two to three years in our, in our streams. Once the par begin to depart, uh, they head to the sea in the springtime, they undergo a smultification process where um, they're able to adjust to the changes in salinity. So if the smolts return uh, the following spawning season, they're called a grills. And if they spend one or more year at the sea, uh, they are coined a multi-sea winner uh, salmon. And yes, salmon are um, integral pair, which means that they're repeat spawners. So the reason uh, for the study, there was one island river that was demonstrating poor juvenile uh, recruitment, even though there was salmon reds being counted. We use salmon reds on PEI to help determine uh, spawning efforts and a uh, general sense of uh, our populations. So in 2015, there was 138 reds on pre-spawn, there were 70 in 2016, and 150 in 2017. So this should equate uh, to a large number of juveniles 
but there was several different parties that went back to Electrofish and uh, they had difficulties finding Young of the Year. So this prompted the need for a study uh, to help determine reasons for poor juvenile recruitment on Priest Pond. Um, it's also identified in the new conservation strategy. And generally there's just a lack of research during the winter months for Atlantic salmon and their uh, egg incubation period. So since developing embryos cannot evade uh, deleterious conditions, um, the survival of the embryos is directly related to environmental conditions. We had two hypotheses um, to why mortality was occurring. Um, the first one was, are in gravel conditions resulting in inadequate salmon embryo development? Or do cold temperatures limit survival as Alvin initiate exogenous feeding? So we had two methods identified to help try to determine when the mortality was occurring. Uh, we were going to use emergence traps to place on the wild reds to see if the embryos were indeed surviving and emerging as fry in the spring. And if so, we'd go back to the same sites later in the summer to electrofish uh, to see if they were um, recruiting um, and surviving to the early life stages of fry. So the main um, focus of the study uh, was on Freeze Pond. And we had the neighboring watershed, uh, North Lake Creek, as a comparison river. Uh, so North Lake Creek has reliable salmon returns on an annual basis. And we also use the West River as a comparison to Central PEI. Uh, the West River also has uh, re reliable salmon returns on an annual basis. <clears throat> we conducted electrofishing surveys in 2019 and 2020 um, to help establish uh, age distribution uh, classes for the young of the year and pair. So we had six sites in Priest Pond, six in North Lake, and six in the West River, uh, plus a 400 meter spot check on, on Priest Pond. <clears throat> so there was healthy populations of young of the year on North Lake and West River. But, but during both the years, 2019, 2020, uh, we didn't find any young of the year in Priest Pond. We did find a handful of power though. So juvenile recruitment uh, did occur a couple of years prior, um, 2017. We conducted red surveys on all three of the rivers. Um, and as you can see, the West River has relatively stable red counts. Um, anywhere from between 100 and 150. Um, but North Lake Creek and Priest Pond have experienced declines in the red counts since 2011. And in 2000, or in the last two years, uh, we didn't find any reds in Priest Pond Creek. And it should be noted that the West River is supplemented by hatchery stocking. So the picture on the left is what a typical red looks like. This is on the West River. You can see the depression that the female leaves as she's burying her eggs, and the eggs are located somewhere in that tail out of gravel. And then the picture on the right shows a salmon, uh, which is always exciting to see a salmon in a freshwater environment. Uh, not too often you get to see them during red surveys, but when you do, it's, uh, it's always exciting. So we set data logger, temperature data loggers uh, throughout um, each drainage basin from the head of tide all the way up into the headwaters, um, just to try to establish temperature regimes for each river. Um, we determined that the temperature regimes did not differ significantly between the river systems. However, we did notice something interesting. Um, during the winter season, there were multiple periods where the water was flowing um, near or just below zero degrees um, for a short period of time. So when we compared uh, water level data to our temperature data, we noticed that whenever there's an increase in water level during the winter months, there's a crash in temperature. Um, so this is predicted that, uh, or I guess assumed, that whenever you have a rain event or a thaw event during the winter months, the water is leaving the landscape um, at near zero degrees, which is driving the stream temperatures down. Um, so this could have future implications as with our changing climate, it's predicted to have, um, we're gonna have more of these rain events or more of these thaw events um, during the incubation or winter um, season. 
we monitored dissolved oxygen loggers. Um, I mean, we installed temperature or dissolved oxygen loggers in the in the rivers in both the stream and within uh, the reds during the incubation period. Um, so we put the we put one dissolved oxygen logger in the stream, and then we put multiple dissolved oxygen loggers nearby the reds in the hypoheric zone, so in the gravel at the same level the eggs were incubating at. Um, and we noticed that one of our sites in North Lake, and there's been more than, more than one site actually we noticed this, but on this graph just shows one in North Lake, that there was a hypoxic period. So that means that the dissolved oxygen logger, or the dissolved oxygen levels were below two milligrams per liter um, for an extended period of time. And on this graph, it shows that trap one had that hypoxic period. And that trap one also had some of the lowest uh, captured emerging fry um, later that spring. So whenever we started looking at some of the data, um, similar to the temperature data, um, we did this with the dissolved oxygen log data that we compared it to the water level. So whenever there's an increase in water level, there's also a crash in dissolved oxygen in the hyperheric zone. Um, the exact reason for this, we're not certain. We have a few, I guess, theories to speculate on it. Um, but yeah, we can't say for certain why this is happening. Um, it's just kind of one of those things that we noticed whenever we started looking at the data. So we constructed emergence traps um, to record the timing and uh, the number of fry emerging from the reds that we we're monitoring. So this was exciting because it was the first record of uh, a wild salmon emergence. So there was a study done in the 90s that uh, used Scotty incubator baskets um, that had that that did capture the emergence timing. But um, the, there was a lot of human interference with the Scotty incubator baskets. They had to extract the eggs, fertilize them, uh, place them in areas that the salmon didn't quite choose. Um, so there's just a lot of human interference with that method. But this, we let the salmon do everything. Um, all we did was put an emergence trap on the salmon reds that we were monitoring. Um, so in 2020, I had three reds in, or three traps in the West River, three in North Lake and two in the Priest Pond. Um, but the two in Priest Pond, we assumed were trail reds, um, but we put them on them anyways just to confirm, and we didn't capture any salmon or any fry. So the, this chart is from 2020. And it was kind of neat because there's two distinct um, patterns here between the West River and North Lake. There's almost a 10-day difference between the peak emergence. So this was kind of neat to see. Um, I guess there's a few factors that can lead to this, whether it be um, environmental conditions, different temperature regimes, uh, timing of the red creation, or it could just be a genetic difference. In 2021, uh, we increased the number of traps and uh, we increased the number of traps for each river, and um, there wasn't as distinct of a difference this year. I guess it was 2021, but yeah, it was uh, still kind of neat to see. It's always exciting to, to see the fry um, emerge, and then it's kind of neat data. So here's the, the traps that we used. Um, I'm holding one on the picture on the left. The picture on the right is one in the river. Um, so we use three pieces of rebar to secure it into place. Uh, there's a holding bottle that we check on a daily basis. And then we'd empty the, the holding bottle into a bowl or a container of some sort and then count the amount of emerging fry on a daily basis. So we put these out about mid-May. Um, didn't know if they're gonna work or not. And the picture in the middle was the first day that I captured fry. And it was, yeah, it was really exciting to see it work. Um, and that first day, I think there was in the ballpark of a 90 or 100 fry that we got in a single day um, out of one red. So it was, um, yeah, really encouraging to see, to see it work. So we, we extracted core samples from the center of the reds in 2021. So we did this after the emergence was complete um, later in the summer. So then we ran the, the core samples through a series of sieves um, down to 63 microns. So what this allowed us to do um, was to characterize the finer sediments um, within the reds. So it, essentially your habitat, or your, uh, red, your red quality. So the difference between the two rivers was actually significant. 
Um, North Lake Creek had significantly more coarse sand, while the West River had significantly more uh, clay, silt, and fine sand. Um, so this, you could probably relate this back to the land usage. West River has slightly more issues with land usage, um, lower percentage in forested landscape, while your North Lake Creek is your pristine watershed with uh, not a lot of road crossings, not a lot of secondary roads, not a lot of agriculture. Um, so yeah, there's uh, quite a difference between the two, two rivers and their, their habitat qualities. So we had to alter the focus of the study going into 2021. Um, since we concluded that the decline of the priest pond um, salmon population was due to the lack of returning mature adults rather than in-stream conditions, and we were unable to test the original hypotheses due to the, um, the lack of REDS to monitor. <clears throat> so then the study focus switched um, to more of a comparison between North Lake Creek and uh, the West River uh, hyperheric conditions and emergence. So going forward in the 2021, we increased the amount of reds that we were monitoring. Um, so in total, between the two rivers, we had 19 reds being monitored. Um, 12 of them were equipped with dissolved oxygen loggers. Seven of them had temperature loggers. Um, and it was about 50-50 between them. We had nine in the West River and 10 on North Lake. So six on each had dissolved oxygen loggers and the rest had temp loggers. Um, so yeah, the goal was to determine which environmental conditions were related to a successful emergence. And we also had a few more variables I didn't discuss in my results there, um, such as like turbidity, water level, and water velocity around the reds. So going forward into my second chapter of my thesis, it's gonna be uh, an applied fisheries management document. Um, and it's gonna identify the shortfalls with the current methods for monitoring salmon populations on PEI. Uh, it will help, it'll include um, suggestions to help improve um, our methods. So this could entertain, um, an example would be like a combination of methods. So it could be using red survey data, but then confirming with electrical fishing index sites. Um, could also um, imply that we standardize a red survey document or methods. Um, but the ultimate goal is uh, to conclude a useful method um, for monitoring our populations to increase our confidence in our population estimates. So that's my master's project um, in a nutshell. Again, I'd like to thank um, the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation for hosting uh, this webinar, giving me this opportunity to present my project. Um, thank you for everyone for listening today. Uh, big thanks to everyone that helped me get this project to where I'm at today, um, like my supervisor and family and friends. And I'd like to mention um, in the memory of Daryl Guignon, um, since I wouldn't have even started this project if it wasn't for Daryl, uh, he came to all the initial meetings. Uh, he suggested this folks, to the folks at UPEI about this project idea. Um, so yeah, thank you everybody. Well, thanks Jordan. Um, now we can open the floor to questions and answers. Uh, and like every other webinar that we do, you can raise your hand and I will unmute you if you want to ask your question. Or you can type in your question and I'll read it out loud for for Jordan to answer. So let's see uh, if we have any coming in. Give them a few seconds. Okay. I got one here that I'll read out loud for you, Jordan. Uh, it says, great project. Just wondering on where and how you came up with the design of the emergence traps. So it was... Uh... A combination of reference material that I found online. There was, uh, I forget the exact paper. I think it might have been from like the 50s or something. They had something similar, and I just adapted the design um, to fit our stream uh, conditions. Um, and yeah, it was just kind of fiddling around out in the garage. We bought this um, Nitex uh, mesh um, that we kind of figured it would work good for the material. And then it was just all kind of improvised. We had a few prototypes. And then going into the second year of doing it, we improved all kind of the, the weaker the weaker points of the design and whatnot. Um, but yeah, they, they worked out quite well. Um, and I think they cost in the ballpark of $100 each. 
Um, but yeah, a lot of hours went into it. And I wouldn't be able to do it without my uh, my stepmom. She she sewed all of the fabric together and stuff. Um, so yeah, there was um, quite a bit of collaboration that went into the final final design of it. But <clears throat> thanks. It's always good to have family around <laughs> to help out. Um, I have a, a positive message here for a very clear presentation and well done. So I think it's good for you to hear that. Um, well, and then I have another question. Um, it says, what program did you use to input your temperature log or data so you could produce those graphs? Um, so my supervisor helped me with those. Um, and I believe he uses Statistica quite a bit. So it could have been where that, that graph uh, came from. Um, and if it wasn't him that made the graph, I either use Statistica or Excel. Um, but yeah, it, yeah, I believe it was Statistica that used, was used to generate those those graphs. Yeah. Okay. And I think that's what we have for question. <clears throat> for those that think of something uh, after, you can always send us an email. I'll make sure Jordan gets it, and we'll do our best to try to answer it. So. To conclude, we just want to say just a big thanks for Jordan to uh, be joining uh, the team here and uh, sharing the information and the results uh, of this study, and we really appreciate it. Um, before we go, this session here is recorded like all our other sessions, so it will be available at the end of today on our YouTube page. So if you know someone that wasn't able to make it live, uh, they'll be able to access it uh, on that uh, website through the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation page. You just go to the bottom and click on YouTube and you'll see all our past uh, webinar sessions. And I'll also take the opportunity to announce that in December, uh, we do have another webinar coming up. Uh, it's December 14th, Michael Arsenault, and it's on remote analysis of stream road crossings in the Woolastook watershed. Uh, so please join us for that one as well. So Jordan, thank you. And thanks everybody for joining us today. So you guys have a great afternoon. Well, thank you. See ya.